Five, I started thinking, hey, I might have underprepared because the person who's doing offering is setting the bar. of God, uh, we will we will soldier on. We will soldier on. Hopefully, uh, by the end of today, I would have made uh, two cents. Amen? Amen. So now, if like uh, Madam, it's your first time. We are on part three. Part one, uh, pro Pastor Masengo, professor. Uh, he started uh, where to start with regards to discernment. Last week we had another powerful speaker. Prophet Muda uh, uh, shedding on discernment. So, uh, if it was an aeroplane, I mean, I'm just on a cruise. Maybe that's why I underprepared. You know, the guys have laid the foundation. So, I highly recommend go to the CFC Ronda Belt Mega page on uh, Facebook. You will get part one, part two, and then you'll be able to forward post this. Because what I'm going to do is I'll springboard from the definition that uh, prophet gave us Amen. to be remembered of descendant because he had a lot of definition that professor gave us this is the importance of cell group Come on, By i'm a product of cell group Amen. so when we meet wednesday you get an opportunity to review mm. the sermon that was preached and then edify one another and then Karakasun says Zinha even words so that uh, you drown in the word. So when we don't go to cell group, you only hear it on Sunday. The following Sunday, go to what was the definition? And then we hear cricket. We don't remember, right? Youth? So the importance of attending cell group is so that we are constantly under the tutelage of the word of God. But the moment we step out of the word, I don't know what else we're going to find outside. So, uh, the definition uh, that I taught, because I was also online in Ruti, you said discernment is the ability to see or perceive things from God's perspective. Yes, I remember it very well. Yeah. It's the ability to see things from God's perspective. <laughs> May you please display image one, the first image. Let's play a little game. What do you guys see? Let me show you. What do you see on the on the on the projector? Okay, speak louder. I would say a bus. You are seeing a bus. What else do you see? Two faces. Two faces. So we've got two perceptions. Who's not seeing anything? Okay, those who are seeing a bus. Here we go. Those who are seeing a bus. If if you're looking at the black on the paper, you will see the bus, right? Oh, my camera is gone. It's okay. You will see the, the bus. But if you look at the white side of it, you will see two faces. So it's got two perspectives. Give me the next uh, image. Next for five. What do you see? A man. A man playing role in the saxophone. Yes, yes, yes. You're seeing a man playing that. Okay. What else do you see? Yeah, you see a woman. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, we, we, we've got two. Okay, who's not seeing anything? So, the shadow, you'll see the man playing the saxophone. And the lighter part, the white part, you see. Imagine God is seeing the saxophone, you are seeing the woman. Or the other way around, you are seeing. The woman, God is seeing the man playing the sense of all. <laughs> so the definition says the ability to see or perceive things from God's perspective. So what happens if I'm seeing from a human perspective and God is seeing things from his perspective? Is there not going to be a conflict here? When you turn to Samuel, then the first scripture, it's Samuel 16, verse 7 says. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. Yeah. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at 
the heart. So this is discernment 101. But for me to be able to discern for me to be able to that, I need to see things the way God sees them. So failure to do that, I'll find myself, God seeing one thing, I'm seeing one thing, and I come here, I preach, and I'm preaching my own thing, not preaching what God wants to be taught. And then guess what? My goodness, the whole church will be misled. It starts there, can you see? But as a church member, as a congregant, you also need to be able to discern As much as he, he's a just passed those in he's been invited. But whatever he's preaching now does not align with the word of God. And that way you're able to say, you know what? Okay, cool. Uh, maybe he did not prepare enough. He woke up in the morning and just came and rocked up, you know? So, if we were talking human to human interaction, the perception, perceptions, we would look at things like uh, your background, where did you grow up, uh, what type of books have you been reading, the shows you've been watching, what contributed to that type of perspective, the way you see things. We would be looking at those things. But in the context of today, December, we are talking about God and man. So now, what, how do we ask the question? How, how do we see what, okay, I'm missing it, or am I aligned or not aligned? So as I was looking at it, uh, it took me to Genesis. You know, I love that chapter. So Genesis 1, God created man in his image and his likeness. So I am assuming when he created man, he gave him the same perspective. Adam and God, Come on. They were seen from one eye to eye, Adam and God. Then after he was created, that was when men was perfect. Because you, whatever God saw, Adam saw. Then what happened? Let's start here. When I grow up, I want to be an artist. <laughs> so, let's do this. That would be Adam, right? It's a how bonnie gaha. They still chase the side. I highly recommend. So, uh, this is Adam. God created Adam in his image, and he's perfect, and he. he but when I, with one arm, right? right? Now, God tells him, if you eat, Genesis 2:17 tells him, if you eat from that tree of knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. By now we know that uh, it's not physical death, it was spiritual death, right? Yeah. So, as we continue, I, I'm learning a little bit the fascination to read from Genesis to Revelation. Okay, we can read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But the more was is in with a particular chapter, with a particular verse, the more God will reveal the, 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 the hidden mysteries in between the commas and the full stops. So now, as we were looking at that, we like, he said, you will surely die. So now, this is the death I think happened. This head was cut off. Let's, let's label our men. This is the spirit. Not the head. It's the spirit. I think we know men is divided into three dimensions. Yes. So spirit, so. and then from the neck up our, somewhere here, cross. Yeah. You will say that's the soul. soul. Hallelujah. You've been to this class. And then from the feet up until somewhere here, your waist. Oh, it will be your flesh. This will be the flesh, right? Yes. So, when you eat the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. die. So the head was cut off. 
And what happened to the head? It fell to the ground. And the last time we were here, we spoke about the head falling, and we were speaking about caterpillars and all those things. So the head fell. So we removed the head. We removed the head, and the head is now somewhere down here. Now, remember we said Adam was perfect. Now, the head is the spirit. So when he died, the spirit was cut off and it fell to the flesh, to the ground. So you cannot see, perceive, discern the things of God when you're in the flesh. So your head fell from its rightful position to the flesh. Oh, I thank you, I thank you. It fell to its rightful, not rightful, it fell to a foreign place. Isn't that, isn't that what Paul says, that you are foreigners? Yes. Your spirit is a foreigner to the flesh. So now, we're talking about discernment, which uh, I truly believe is a topic of that demands growth. Because now we're talking about meat things. When we go to, remember, I think a while back I told that the spirit is symbolic to the man. The soul is the woman. And then when you, you, you look at, okay, uh, Paul says, I do not allow women to preach in the church. He's not referring to women, women but he's referring to the soul. Why? Because the soul, that's where your emotions, feelings, and we all these things, they stay there. They are not linked up to the discernment area. This is where we discern and we continue. We are connected to heaven via our spirit, right? The head. That's how we are connected to heaven. I'll explain as we continue. So for now, just ask your neighbor, where is your head? Where is it? The soul level, the flesh level, or is that its rightful position? As <laughs> we continue. For us to, 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 to discern or go back to take the head back to its rightful position, we need to be able to see God's patterns and God's uh, blueprint in scripture so that we do not do our own thing. Okay, we need to get to a point where we see the way God sees things. So, when we turn to Genesis 15, and the mic was gone. When we turn to Genesis 15, verse 12 to 13, it says, uh, and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon who? Abraham. Uh, and lo, and whoa, I think that's King James, okay? A deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and lo, and, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And I think that testing me with King James is fine, let's go. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a short, short, shorty that. That thy seed shall be a stranger in a land. As for the vision that you need. Uh, NLT or NIV. Yes. You don't have it. It's fine. Um, let me read from mine. Yeah. Let me read from mine. Pastor uh, I think he King James. It's full of me to trade, to talk, you know? You can't just want to trade in the kitchen. Yeah, I'll try to project. Hallelujah! Amen. So, when we look at uh, Genesis 15, God is talking to Abraham, and he's telling him, uh, guess what? Your descendants will go down to Egypt, and there will be slaves. I think the, the next picture, if you care, if you can, it's fine. So now, we're going to be looking at patterns. Patterns, patterns, patterns. Let me use a different color. There's Canaan up there. So God is talking to Abraham in Canaan, and he's telling him this, that your descendants 
you will find themselves in Egypt being slaves for 430 years. So the patterns, patterns. Uh, let's represent Canaan with a triangle. For, you know, God the Son, God the Father, and God the uh, Holy Spirit. And then we go to the second dimension would be the wilderness. And the third, okay, the other around. This will be the, this is Egypt, wilderness, and then this is Canaan. So God tells them that your descendants will find themselves going to Egypt. They're going down. They head going. Can you see that? You see that? Yeah. They head going yeah. down. He tells them that they will find themselves in that position. Mm. Where now they are slaves in Egypt. So let's, we need to bring it back home. Your head fell to Egypt, the flesh, where the head under the spirit. You're going to be slain to the flesh. So the question is, oh, Lord, because Christ has come, and you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, but however, the flesh still holds the spirit man captive. You want to do great exploits. You want to worship the Father in spirit and truth. But the flesh, Egypt, is holding the spirit man captive. Amen. He's in slavery. The spirit man. He wants to open up. Because that's his rightful position. But Pharaoh, which is your flesh. Uh, I think when we read it, it says Genesis 15. You, however, will go uh, to your ancestors in peace and be buried to a good old age. Uh, I said from 12, sorry. And the sun was setting, Abraham fell into deep sleep, and a thick and uh, dreadful darkness came upon him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 430 years your descendants will be in a strange country. And then we're we, we, we deducing. So the spirit will be in a strange country, carpet flesh, for 430. And then what will happen when they are there? Uh, in a strange country, not, uh, uh, not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. So the spirit man is mistreated here at the flesh. Also, let the poor say, the spirit I am rich but poverty there the flesh. Let the sick say I am healed. I, I want to operate in perfect health which Christ bought for me. But the flesh is holding me captive. So I need to find a way to get out of that. And then after 430 years, who's that guy? Moses came through. God sent Moses to come and liberate them. Christ was. So they cried out to God. You say, Egypt must set us free. So we also need to cry out, like, you know what? I'm sick and tired of being a slave to the flesh. Yes. Here's, here's what happens when it comes to this flesh business. Uh, turn to Galatians. I think I didn't give you Galatians 5. Uh, we will look at, start with 19, and then we'll be 19, 17. We'll be doing this. Now, the works of the flesh, let's go to the fruit of the spirit, which is the next one. The next one, the next one. It says, the fruit of the spirit are. This is what you desire to do. This is what the spirit wants to do. Peace, joy, love. Uh, I think it's 21, or 22, sorry, 22. Peace, love, joy, and all those good things. Do you want to do that? Do you want to? But when you go back up to 17, it tells you, go back up to 17, it tells you that this is what the flesh will do. But because, because the spirit is in a foreign country, it's not able to exercise dominion. You're in a foreign country. You don't belong there, prodigal son. You are not able to exercise the dominion that you have. So now you find yourself producing these types of uh, fruits. So as I was looking at that, <laughs> I, I, 
I, I grew up thinking like, like once you are born again, you know, uh, you are spiritual time talking, and you are in a prayerful household. Ah, witchcraft, ah, those things, they should not be affecting us. Because our God is strong, right? Amen. Here's what I grew up with. This is me. The Bible is Christ. For those who are in Christ, they are a new creation. So for you to get to me via witchcraft and all those things, you have to go through Christ. Come on. That's how I grew up. And then as I was preparing this, I realized like, yeah, when you are at this dimension, but the moment you leave this dimension, you left Christ at the third dimension, now you are at the flesh dimension. Guess what? Guess what? Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? That witchcraft is possible because you are at the wrong place. That's why we, these guys who operate in the art of the dark, darkness, then we have access to God. They'll be able to attack us. We need to be able to control anymore. But you're in the flesh, you're not able to control them. This friend of mine is full of non terms. This friend of mine, or whoever. But I should not be drinking coffee with this person because. Because you're in the wrong place, so they end up dominating us because we are misplaced. And you are not going to be able to discern because you are in the wrong place. And then we want to not so be. So, uh, after 433, 430 years, Moses came and then they left, right, to go uh, worship. They find themselves in the wilderness which is moved from Egypt, they go to wilderness. Mm. But now, wilderness is not the final destination, yeah. as much as they spend 40 years there. That's not the final destination. The final destination is Canaan or the spirit, the third dimension. Mm, yeah. But they find themselves 40 years in the wilderness. Yes. Why? I was like, thank you, Lord. Turn to Matthew 4. Hopefully I'm making sense. Amen, brother. Amen. 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 This is the temptation of Jesus Christ, which I truly believe. Every believer, you need to undergo this temptation, the wilderness temptation, where God, Arusha, which is Egypt, is the flesh still dominating you. Yeah. So you should be able to dominate those tests like Christ did, right? All three of them in successfully. So now, verse one. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Verse two. <laughs> After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Proper hungry. Verse 3. Then the tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Let's put them for a minute. <laughs> so, the, the temptations is the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and pride of life. When you read all that. But as I was looking at verse 3, you know, the way the author of the Bible was playing with words, he says, tell these stones, stop that stones, and when you turn to expo, not, not, not you guys, okay, if you want to, but if, when you turn to Acts 4, 8 to 12, Jesus Christ is described as the stone. So the devil is telling the stone, turn, turn, turn him the stone to turn a, st a stone to a stone. I don't know if you see that. And when you continue, he says, this stone must become bread. And when you turn to John 6, 35, Jesus Christ is described as the bread. So I was like, what, what temptation is this? He's telling, he's telling the stone to turn the stone into a bread. Where he eats the bread. So the bread must eat the bread. Like, what's going on there? So as I was looking at that much, much, much deeper, I started saying like, no, no. See, Yeah. <laughs> The real temptation here, it's in the, if you are the son of God. Amen. This is the same temptation that, who's that guy? Adam was faced up with. Yeah. 
If you are truly in the image of God, eat that, that, that fruit. It was an image challenge. So now, if you don't know your identity, yeah. you find yourself in the wilderness for 40 years. Uh-huh. You are saved, yeah. tongue talking, spirit filled, demon crazy. But when it comes to your identity, you are. Who are you? Who are you? <coughs> Amen. Amen. So, ah, last page. <laughs> So as I said, those temptations, when you look at all of them, it's just the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and pride of life. So you can do introspection to see, okay, what am I struggling with? Because the bread temptation, it's appetite. If, if as a man, I've got a problem with sexual appetite, I'll find myself in the wilderness yeah. for 40 years because I'm failing to conquer those appetites. Mm. If I've got pride, I'm not teachable, I'm Kuzeg. I'll continue in the wilderness. You won't ascend to the third dimension. Because now remember, the third dimension is where the spirit is. You didn't, you don't get ahead of myself. Now, with that in mind, it takes us back to, it takes us to the first presentation that is Matthew 4, 17. He says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, the word repent, net for five, that's Adam's face. It's re, write it like that. Re has to do with do over. You were here, you have to go back there. Pent house, pen the highest point. So now, Christ is speaking for the very first time. Remember, for the very first time. He goes to these Jewish people, looks at the head at the flesh, and tells the flesh, repent. Move away from the crowd and go back to the highest point. Yeah. That's not where you belong. For the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is at hand there. But when you are down there, you won't be able to see nor enter. Look at the mouse. You won't be able to see nor enter the, the kingdom because you are operating at a low position. And we are repent. Do and go back. Go back where you belong. Because once you get there, once you get there, now the fun begins. We turn to Exodus 25. That's where now the fun begins. And then he's told you, you need to repent. Go back to the highest point. You don't belong at the ground. You don't belong at the flesh. You need to have a political son awakening. He came to himself and then he went back. So, Moses is instructed by God to build a tabernacle. Remember? Genesis 20, no, Exodus 25. God gives Moses an instruction. Build me a tabernacle. So the mistake that we make is we think the tabernacle is a huge building somewhere out there. Oh, this one, when we go to Jerusalem, no, 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 no. This is the temple. Yeah. This. You are the temple or the tabernacle of God. Then he says, when you go down to the scripture, so that I may tabernacle among them. Now, where does he tabernacle? Where does God stay? Bible school students, Arie. This is the Holy of Holies, HH. Holy of Holies. That's where you find the presence of God. Yeah. Remember cherubim and all those things? And there was that veil, the veil that separated us from them. So now, God resides at the Holy of Holies. So now, when you think of the tabernacle, you need to start taking off me, right? This flesh. So now, the outer court, that's the flesh. The inner court, that's the soul. Holy of Holies, that's my spirit. So God tabernacles, God stays in my spirit. Can you see how now we go back to oh, one night, one night. Yeah. We, When you go back to the tabernacle, you go back to the highest point, you repent, and now you stay there. Yeah. That's when now you are able to see eye to eye with God. And now, look, look at this. You'll be like, who's that, that guy you're talking about? Jacob. Mm. You'll be like that guy. Remember when he got to last, he put his 
hit on the stone. Who's the stone? Who's the stone? He put his head on the stone, Christ. And what happened? When he was sleeping, the heavens opened up. He was able to see angels going up and down. So when you are here, when you put your head on Christ, when you put you the word of Christ, you'll be able to see heavens open up. Is that not discernment? You need to understand that you start at Egypt, sin. You accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you need to start making that journey up. So now when we look at biblical characters that we, we can see, okay, you, you, you are at which stage? Now, as a Baruch, we need to know the people that we are shepherding. Where are they in this journey of life? So now, the outer God represents, or it's represented by, Esau. Esau was the man of the field. He worked out there. He's the outer God. He had no regard for the things of God. I think it's uh, Hebrews 12, 16 or 6. He had no regard for the things of God. So the flesh has no regard for the things of God. So the moment you see a person behaving like an Esau, they are willing to sell their birthright for a slice of bread. They are willing to do whatever. For, for food, then you know, okay, we are dealing with an outer court mentality. Okay. They, they will grow, they will yeah. grow. Yeah. And when you are at the outer court level, this is where now, yeah, now I'm gonna, we, say, we say we are going to meet. This is the faith dimension. Mm. Amen, Amen. Amen. Faith comes by? Yeah. So in the outer court, you operate by what you hear. When you turn to talk, 15. He says, I do not call you uh, a servant anymore, but I call you son. But he starts by saying, you are a servant at the outer court because you do not know what your master is doing. You operate on instruction, what we tell you here. The instructions you are given, you operate with that. So you acquire your faith. So you are operating at faith level. Nothing wrong. And then we are growing. So from the faith level, you add your faith, you add your faith, you add it, you add it, you grow, you grow, you grow. Then you move to the second dimension, which is in accord, the soul. Right? Now when you get there, uh, Jacob supplants Esau. The soul supplants the flesh. So you are no longer operating at flesh level. Now you are at soul level. So Jacob, the tricks that comes in. So we should be very careful of the soul. <laughs> because uh, that's where your emotions, your intellect, your will, they might trick you think, well, I'm having a God experience. God, no, it's just oxytocin and all those hormones. You are just going through your hormonal cycle. <laughs> so we should be very careful because if Jacob, the tricks, that's where we need to discern. Oh. Amen. 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 It's okay, right? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> so, Jacob represents hope. You move from faith, you go to hope. And then there's a scripture like that. It says, uh, now this abides faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of all is love. love. Look at that. Now, faith, outer court, hope gives you vision. Yeah. You, you start seeing the things that your master is doing. When you go, the very same chapter, John 15, you go down with it. He says, I don't want to call you a servant, but now you are a friend. Because what the Father has shown me, or has given to me, I have shown you as a friend. So now you're at a friend level. Now you see what he's doing, you are able to do. You operate with that hope. No, man. You know what? Armageddon is coming in to do 
ABCD, the final fight, Amen. right? Amen. But now, that's not the final destination, being a friend, no. No. You need to be a son. So the next dimension, the third level, is sonship. Amen. He says, uh, Philip asks him, hey, when are we going to see the father? And he says, oh, oh Philip, I've been with you so long, and you have not seen. I am the father. Are one. So the moment you get to that level, sonship, you and the father are one. What is this? By the time you get to that level, you have grown. Because you, 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 you get said, you hear faith. You grow. Hope. You, I wish he is. I was out. And then by the time you get to the third dimension, you get to the dimension of love. And love abides. Oh, it's greater than all of them. That's when you become a son. So for you to operate at that level, as we are on this journey of going back, still time was about. In the absence of love, this is why the church is so weak. We are operating at the soul level. Because if we are constantly picking, gossiping, and you know, doing all those things, you know, we are not at the love yet stage. Because love covers the multitude of sins. Love loves the unlovable. Oh, come on now. So God loves the unlovable. Yes. God covers a multitude. When you remove that word love, put God. God covers a multitude of sins with the blood of the Lamb. Yeah. Mm. Oh. So for us to open at that level, we need to tap into God's type of love, agape. God's type of love. But as long as we are not operating there, I'm still working on it myself. And then that's why when Jacob, <laughs> that dream he saw the heavens opened up, he saw angels going up, going up and down, up and down. Because we vacillate, we are there, oh, we felt the presence of God, man, you know. Man, poor man, there's no salam to his tattoos and gender. We go back there. So we are vacillating. We, we are the end of this third dimension. And then, boom. And then, guess what? We end up saying, I only have a God encounter and experience when I'm in church. But when I get home, I want to hear up, I have to go there. God, no, it's failure to recognize that, oh, okay, I'm not operating in love. If I'm, I'm constantly operating in love, I'll find myself at that dimension. So we gave, uh, from a south, we went to. Jacob. Jacob wrestles with God. And then he comes out, his name is changed. He's Israel. Israel. You know what does Israel mean? He who contends with God. He, when you contend with God, in his presence, yeah. and contend, he's having conversations with him. Very right? like, but God, how, can, how, how should we do this? How can we do this? And then now, he will constantly reveal or show you the things that you're supposed to do, or the things that the church is supposed to do. This is the part now we will be operating like Nathan. So now, who's Nathan? Uh, someone, I think, right? Second or first. I don't know if you're on my notes, I think I gave it to you. Uh, when we read uh, Second Samuel, the story of Nathan and David, have you found it? It's not there. Oh, okay. Second uh, Samuel 12. Second Samuel 12. Sorry about that. I thought this is the last page. There's another page. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, I still have time. Hallelujah. Yeah. So, Second Samuel 12. And we read from verse 1. Okay. If they are not finding it. Here we go. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he arrived, he said to him, there were two men in a certain city. Ah, oh, you are too fast. <laughs> there were certain men in the city. One rich and the other one poor. Next. The rich man had a large number of sheep and cattle. 
But the poor man had nothing except one small ewe lamb that he had bought. It lived and grew up with him and, and his children. It shared his meager food and drank from his cup. It slept in his arms and it was like a daughter to him. Let's continue. Now, a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man could not bring himself to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor, man, uh, poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guest. Jesus. David was infuriated with the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. As we pause there. I have to think Nathan is looking at David and is like, My goodness, loans are not The hypocrisy, yeah! He's, remember, God had already revealed this parable to Nathan, what had happened. Yeah. So for those who do not know the background story, it is in jail. <laughs> so it was time of war, right? So now all the men and all the kings went to war. David decided, nah, I'm not going, I'm gonna chill home. A king who's not where he's supposed to be. Yeah. The head is not where he's supposed to be. So David stays home. So as he's, he's home, he decides to take a walk on his rooftop, the palace. And as he's walking, like, right? Being a carnal man, he would say he was carnal. He sends his servants, tells them, you know, bring me a chick over the side. The Beshiva comes through, this is the king. He might kill him if I would call, you know? He calls, she calls, and when she gets that side, um, they knew each other, you know? They know him of Nui. They, until the news, they know him of Nui. And then she was pregnant. That one. And then she was pregnant. And then uh, she went to their home, she was pregnant. Now, David finding out that she's pregnant. Ubi is in Dr. Yaga. Beshiba. Yeah. Beshiba is a very woman. So he calls Uriah back from the war to come and say, you know what, uh, it you know? <laughs> yeah, no, it's not me, it's in the battle. Yes. So, Nathan, what was this? Uriah, Uriah refused to go to his own house to know his wife, to do the deeds. What shall I in the king's court and one guard and all those things? When David found out that that's what he did, guess what? He said, okay, that's fine. Go back to war. He sends him back to war, and then when he gets to war, he tells the general, when the war intensifies, back off. Back off, and then and guess what? Long story cut short, the lamb or the ewe that was killed, Uriah. David had so many women that he could choose from. But he took Bathsheba from Uriah, who loved his wife so much. But now, we are at verse 5. He says, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. So Nathan is like, my goodness, hypocrites. You're the one who did this. And then, yeah, but now, what I wanted to highlight there was, we should be operating like Nathan. Where hey, my God. God reveals things to us, past, present, future. Yeah. We are able to diagnose people's problems and come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. I think uh, discernment, it, it may be mirrors or treasure in the gift of prophets. So now, when you discern, you'll be able to see my problems and help me with coming up with solutions. But like Nathan, it protects us, the art of discerning, protects us from deception in this day and age that we live in. That there's so much wickedness happening out there. So as a child of God, 
Frankly, they tend to say we are naive. Mm. We become naive because you are not connected to the source that will tell you this is not the business partner you should do business with. Yeah. Don't go there. Don't attend that class. Take this subject. All those things. But because we are not connected, we, we are, that's why we are easy to be duped or deceived. That's the importance of discernment. And uh, this one, I'm still learning. I'm still learning it as well. What, what discernment does, it lifts the veil of the unseen spiritual world. Because we, we, we cannot operate uh, as, you know, an ostrich. When danger comes, it puts its head under the ground and acts as if, yeah, they won't be seen. So we cannot operate like that and act as if, like, we don't know that Paul says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, spirits. He mentions them for our war. Mandulo. Yeah. Our war started yeah. in heaven. When Lucifer decided to rebel against God, Christ, and everything that they stood for. That's why he becomes the accuser. That's where the war starts. And he was cast down to earth. But now, earth, again, it's the earth, and there's the firmament, and there's heaven, and there's the heaven, heaven. But now, he is in the family. If you read the story of Daniel, where he prayed, and in that 21 days, Mamrud, the angel says, the day you prayed, God released the answer to your prayer. The day, the day, you prayed to the God released it. But for 21 days, I was held up by Belzebub, the prince of Persia. So now, if as believers, we are not going to educate one another that discernment lifts that veil, so that you can see, no man, I need to travel more. Because the reason we have done it fast, 21 days fast, it's because for 21 days, he had to continue praying until the answer manifested. But the angel went back and spoke to Michael, and Michael they came and defeated that uh, Prince of Pain. So now, we need to know such things. But I cannot be a lazy, fair type of believer. I grew up, uh, I'm still growing up. The uh, spiritual warfare, I'm learning, I'm learning. You, especially when you get into marriage. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah spiritual warfare is in the outside. But not that could be too. It's the spirit behind. Yeah. Amen. 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 So, we need to get to that level as we connect to the third dimension where we are operating as Israel. That, uh, you know what? Uh, prayer should be our lifeline. Yes. And now there's types of prayer. And the types of prayers when now you, you, you fight with that those people who are on the other side. Because mm -hmm. now they know, you know what, uh, their time is limited. So they are constantly fighting to remove us from here, mm -hmm. to come back to the soul or the flesh. Yeah. And when you're at the flesh, that's where they dominate us. Mm -hmm. And we are not able to fend for ourselves. Jesus. So family, um, I thank you for your ears. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not take it for granted, no slap. I am also still learning these concepts uh, as the Lord continues to reveal and show us. Uh, the Bible is a parable itself, so we should not uh, read it in, in passing. We should constantly see Julie and Queen Baba Jehovah. As I was preparing this, uh, the other thing that I saw, this is my conclusion, the other thing that I saw was. We, as long as I'm comfortable with people ridiculing the things of God yeah. or making fun of the things of God, mm. I'm operating either at the flesh level or soulish level. Mm. 
there should be a righteous anger that boils up within me yeah. whenever people start ridiculing the things of God because now I'm getting connected to Him. Yeah. But if I'm not, people can talk bad or do whatever they do about the things of God. I wouldn't be affected because I'm operating at the flesh level. Yeah. So, and one of the favorite scriptures they love is the turning of water to wine. Mm-hmm. Hey, deep things there. Whose wedding was it? And then Jesus attended the wedding. Yeah. Who's wedding that wedding between the church and Christ? And the mother tells the disciples, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Do it. So now, whatever he tells us to do, do it. What happens? Water will turn into wine. Amen. 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 Amen.